test. I sh we we should be live. Reset, reset. Okay, I'm testing the mic now. Am it, 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 is my is my voice very very pronounced inside the mic? Yeah. Okay. We need to find we need to find a way to stand this. I don't think think figure it out. I don't think we'll have to Hey, would you like to hold this? Thank what? you. Wait, what did I do? You point the microphone like towards the screen. You can like pass it to your friends. I gotta hold a microphone. Wait, where is it? I'm covering the camera. Okay. Wait, does the video matter? Well, like, yes, it does. Oh, so we we are recording with this. Yeah. We're live streaming. <laughs> it's all you. Okay. Wait, I haven't eaten dinner yet. Do I get a chance to eat sometime? Oh yeah, that would be so smart. <laughs> okay. Wait. How does that work? It's like here. Yeah, yeah. Can you pour it again? Okay. This side doesn't work. Oh, no. Okay, perfect. Alright. Mm. This was hands here. Yes. Wait, I think I might. I might need to hold the. Wait, you can just like, let it hang around. Really. This? Yeah. You can oh, like, clip wait. it somewhere, right? Is there a clip? There's a screw, but like. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe like just put it here or something. Yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah, we could just tape it. Oh. Uh, yeah, we can just tape it if you want. Do we even have tape? On my one? Yeah, yeah my tape is probably tape. better. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. Oh, oh, oh. Or well, you can put the whole thing here. Like, in no, this never mind. Thing. I don't know. Can you press this? Wait, what? Can you press this? Yeah. Do you want to put it in? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we yeah, picked up. Perfect. Yay, we're so intelligent. Also, we should fix the angle now. Let's make sure this doesn't slide down and die. Okay. Wait, we need to fix the angle, right? Maybe that's how it's intended to be used. Who knows? Wait, but then the mic is like in a weird position. <laughs> Yes. Wait, do you think this is fine? Is, is this fine? It's fine. Wait, well, you're Carol, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Which team are you on? That makes sense. Okay. I'm not dead.
guys from California? What? Are you guys from California? No, I'm on hacking my team. Oh, you're on hacking my team. But like you're running the YC thing? I saw that they're like but I'm a student. I'm a student. I saw they're based in like SF or something. But I think, yeah, they are. Oh, okay. They are from SF. And you guys are like... I go to school, yeah. I mean, I'm also a fraud student. Oh. First 
off. This room is very full. Turns out maybe we should have gotten a bigger room. Um, but I see some empty seats. So raise your hand if there's an empty seat next to you. Okay, someone should grab that one. Um, there's some space on the floor over there, and there's more space like along the sides over there. Oh, and just to note, um, we are live streaming this right now. So if you want, you can go to like another room, but you can still watch it. You know, if you get tired of like standing and stuff, yeah. Cool. So this guy named Paul Graham, who's SAT bred, um, came and he gave a talk 
at Harvard called How to Start a Startup that was actually very similar to this talk that we're going to give today. And I was sitting in the audience, and at the end of that talk, I decided to start a startup. <laughs> <laughs> and the next 18 years has been that. Um, so I, um, um, my co-founder was a friend of mine from, um, who, who I met on campus, and we left Harvard, and we did YC in the summer of 2006, and then we moved to San Francisco, and we worked on this company called Scribd for 10 years, and then I joined YC. So one of the things that maybe a lot of you are wondering, and especially graduating seniors, how many of you want to just go on once you graduate and do a startup? Raise your hand. How many of you think that you need to work in industry for a couple of years, then start your company? Mm, we want, we want, come on, look, that's okay. Um, so, what, I guess with this, Gary, what do you think students should start a company right out of school? What, what do you think, why is that? So, one of the most common questions that we get from students is like, when should I start a company? Like, hey, you're basically, you're trying to think about like how to fit doing a startup into your life. If you're in this room, presumably it's because you were at least somewhat interested in doing a startup at some point, otherwise I don't know why you're here. Um, and, but like, you're probably, if you're like most of the people that we talk to, you're like not exactly sure like how it fits in. And so there's like three basic times as a student that you can do a startup. You can either drop out of college and do a startup in the middle, you can wait until you graduate, you can do a startup like right after you graduate, or you can like go and work for a few years first as an employee and then do a startup. I guess there's like you read a passage of grad school and things like that, but those are the three main things. Right. So I dropped out of college and did a startup. So I, I took the first path. I worked for about two years before I started my company, but I knew I wanted to start it because I read a lot of Paul Grant's essays in uh, when I was an uh, undergrad at CMU studying engineering, and I also <laughs> immigrated to the U.S. I was on a visa, and part of it is. I needed to build up some financial cushion to support my parents and my family and pay off student loans. So that's why I didn't do it right out of college, which might be the case for some of you, but I knew I wanted to do it because I worked at a, I worked at a big company and it sucked. <laughs> it's like, never again, never gonna. Which company? I worked at Intel for a bit. I was like, never again, this is so boring, it's so cool. How many of you have done an internship at a big tech company? How many of you thought it was like boring? Two. Yeah, imagine if that was your life. It's like you have the next 40 years. 40 years. You just like lay down and you're like done. This is it. Everyone is just so chill and you're here at MIT surrounded by the smartest people. It was hard to get into here. Then you go into industry and the people are kind of just like, eh, is this it? You don't want to peak right now at MIT. You could do so much more. All of you. You're all incredibly smart. There's a reason why you're at MIT. So don't end up kind of just laying down in a big tech company. That was like kind of what I thought. Here's another question that we get from students a lot. How do I know if I have what it takes to be a startup founder? How should I decide between being a startup founder Well, the reality is, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Right? Yeah. Right? The reality is that even as all of you are young and don't know much about whether you have what it takes, but the reality is all the successful founders at YC, and there's so many that are from MIT, were in your shoes at some point, and they didn't know much, but in the process of building it, and also getting punched in the face a lot, they build incredible skills to really pull it off. And you actually have it in, in you a lot than more you know, than you know, because it's this aspect of being uh, young and naive. It's actually a double-edged thing. It's like, yes, you don't know anything, but you also, because you don't know anything, you have so much optimism to try things that um, haven't worked out. I mean, an example I can tell of a company called Benchling, how many of you know what Benchling is? Oh yeah, some of you know Benchling. So Sajid was an MIT grad. He was just in your shoes studying CS and biomedical engineering. And uh, the story is he was obsessed 
with kind of with biotech and a lot of tooling around there. So we built a company, Benchlick, which is building this notebook for uh, scientists and researchers to kind of track their research because he did internships and science projects and that was the hard thing. And this wasn't built before and he got so many no's and rejected so much and he went through the batch in 2012. 2012. And for a bit of context, in 2012, there were other companies that were really taking off in year three or five. Like there was Instacart in that batch, there was Coinbase in that batch, so a bunch of DoorDash in that batch, a bunch of monster companies. And they all like were growing, but Sajid was very young. He was younger than all these other founders. But it took him a long time to really get it working. The reality is he was selling this tool to a bunch of uh, researchers in universities and no idea if you could make money. He's like, okay, this notebook that like, helps you track experiments. Why is it even a good idea? But it took so long because once these researchers used it, they actually liked it. They were like all grad students. And once they graduated from their PhD, they went to work at pharma companies, then they would bring the software in. That is such a long sales cycle. You gotta wait for a PhD to graduate. <laughs> yeah. Then make the sale. So imagine that being Sajid, grinding it in and out to get this working, and it really took like good six years from when he started the company, five six years, to really get a glimmer of actually getting the fir first legit good customer. And by that time, he was about twenty five six. We're still pretty young, right? And he knew he was working. And because he was young, he didn't know much and he didn't give up and he was still young he has a life ahead he was like if this doesn't work out he's like still young enough to try other things but he really stuck with it and the reality we start up is not this flashy um like the social like facebook with like overnight success social network social network right that took a long time but look at him now he built this monster of a company it's like worth four billion dollars and it's like closing six, seven figure, or not even eight figure contracts with pharma today, 10 years later. So speaking of Benchling, Benchling is a great example of a company, of a YC company started by a recent MIT guy. Those in this room might not know sort of like the long, like the deep history between like YC and MIT. Oh, yeah. So we should probably tell them about that. So YC has funded over 400 MIT grads. Um, of the YC top one, of the YC top companies, 63 of them have an have, have an MIT alum founder, and that 63 of the top companies is the most from any school in the country. So MIT is like actually the dominant like source of YC's billion dollar companies. Um, earlier today, we were down the road at that other school in <laughs> uh, And I didn't tell them this, but MIT has more than three times as many billion dollar companies from YC as Harvard does. Pick the right school. Yeah, more than three times. And, and the reason is not hard to get that. It's like, MIT people are builders. That's who goes to MIT. It's like people who like building stuff. And actually, that is the raw material that creates great startup teams. It's people who like building stuff. Because the co-founder for Sajid, he was super, they, they both were very technical. He won BattleBot. I don't know if they still run it. Mm -hmm. BattleBot. <laughs> yeah, BattleBot. He was hardcore. He won it multiple times. Can you believe that? So, yeah, that's what it takes. How we talk about some of the other companies that are that were started by people who are you know zero to three years older than the people in this room that came that were from MIT students that went through YC and that are now like famous companies that you all um, have likely heard of. There's like a lot of them. A lot of them. We have such a big list. You're just yeah. like naming the companies. Dropbox. Who's a Dropbox user? Okay. Nice. How many of you know uh, Scale or AI? <laughs> Ginkgo Biowork? Ginkgo Biowork, yeah. Yeah, that went public recently, Biotech. Yeah. Cruise, the self-driving car company. Yeah. Amplitude? Not as many, but they also went public. This yeah. is a big analytics uh, company. Um, segment? Segment, yeah. Tell stories and all of these. 
Stripe. Stripe? Oh, yeah. Although, we were kind of debating whether Patrick Gever actually went to MIT. He dropped out of MIT. Does anyone know whether Gever actually, like, showed up? <laughs> I'm not actually sure if he did. I think he said, like, a semester. I think, yeah, I, I, it was, like, yeah, just, like, I very think, brief. But like it is that. in his YC application drive. <laughs> <laughs> just brief stint. But even then, one of you, or many of you, could be future Collison yep. or Houston. Yeah, all of these people started their company when they were, like, 22. So Out of school or, or dropped out of school like Alex? Or younger, yeah. yeah. Should we talk about... Um, how about startup ideas? Yes, how to come up with startup ideas as a college student. Yes, we can tell some of the stories for these companies, like how did they actually come up with their startup idea then and end up being a billion dollar company? Yeah, um, so do you want to tell one about internships? Sure. So internships is like a really common way that people came up with their startup idea. Do you want to give an example? So Segment, amplitude. Well, there's the mix panel. Oh, yeah. Let's see. I think Amplitude was also an interesting case. Yeah. Um, so uh, one example is um, this company called Mixpanel. Mixpanel was, um, they make analytics software. Like if you have a mobile app and you want to know like how people are using your mobile app, you can install Mixpanel and it'll give you all these like metrics and stuff about like how people use your app. And um, this is very popular. It's a billion dollar company now. And basically the way the mix panel founder came up with the idea is when he was in college, he interned at this company called Slide, which you haven't heard of, but it doesn't matter. And Slide had built a really great internal tool for doing analytics for their own mobile apps. And the founder realized that like the tools that he built and used at Slide would be really useful to other companies. And he basically started mix panel to like productize this, this internal product. And there's a lot of YC companies that like follow that basic template of they saw something in an internship or learned something in an internship and that became their startup idea. So I saw a lot of you raise your hands doing an uh, internship. So what do you think that happens when you do an internship at a tech company? They give you uh, the really boring stuff, right? How many of you are like really boring stuff you built? <laughs> raise your hand. So there's this company called Retool. How many of you know of Retool? So it's uh, worth $3 billion. And when they uh, went through YC, they actually applied with a completely different idea. It was basically Venmo for the UK. And they grind with this idea. Like this is not the glamorous part for sure, and you're not, not gonna hear this in the PR and public version. But they grind for it for like two years, and it was not working. But it turns out one of the founders had done like three internships at Palantir. And he was just like you building like really boring stuff, he was tasked to build a bunch of internal tools and it just sucked. I think because it sucked so much, he probably like, it was a bit of traumatic. You kind of want to block it out of your memory. And only in desperation, he kind of came out and the startup Venmo for UK wasn't working. He's like just coming up with ideas and he remember, oh, this very painful memory of building boring stuff. Turns out a lot of engineers hate building internal tools. And I wonder why nobody has built API and tooling to build internal tools. So that's kind of how they came up with Retool, which by the way, uh, they had to defer Demo Day because Venmo was not working. It was like not going well. Yeah, they didn't get into YC with the idea for Retool. They got in with their earlier idea. Venmo, and they yeah. spent the whole summer trying to like make, make this Venmo for the UK thing work and like it never worked. Yeah. And then they just like went off into the wilderness and they came back a year later having like pivoted to Retool. Yeah, then they uh, presented not in their batch, but the following one, with a retool, which ended up working out really well. And they also were just fresh college grads. That's how they came up with that idea. Other stores? Things that you want. Yeah, can tell the Dropbox story. Does anyone know how Dropbox got started? So the way Dropbox got started is um, Drew Houston, who's the founder, he was, a, he was an MIT student, and um, he was dating this girl who lived in New York City. And on the weekends, he would like go to New York City to visit her. And he was always really annoyed that like his laptop in New York City couldn't access the files on his desktop back home at MIT. And this just like drove him crazy that there wasn't a good solution to like sync the files across his two computers. And so Dropbox was like scratching a personal bit.
and that's how it started. It's not like a fancy story. Sometimes you, I don't think like founders when they become super huge, they don't really tell because it's not, it's not a fun story. It's not like super hero adventure kind of thing. Yeah. But that's the real thing. Just like solve a problem you have. Strike too. That was also a problem that they had. So the the way Strike got started is um, this is a little known fact. Before the Strike founder started Strike, they had an earlier startup that failed. Strike is actually their second company. They never talked about the first company. Automatic. Yeah. yeah automatic. Um, and their first company basically they had to implement credit card processing for their first company. And in the process of implementing credit card processing, they realized that all the existing products that let you accept a credit card on your website sucked. And that was how they had the idea. It's actually a very uh, common pattern. This is why being young and giving more shots of gold is yeah. effectively that, like to build a big company. And a lot of you are ambitious. This is why you're here. Increases your chances of success. Yeah, they, they started two companies before they were 20 years old. Yeah. So that's how you do it. The first shot. The gold. Brex founders, the same thing, also started two companies before they were 20 years old. Yeah. And then the last, uh, the third shot, that's where they hit gold. So I think the cool thing about being young, you get time is at your disposal. So you can give it so many tries. And there's a story of Segment, which started with uh, four MIT grads, and they applied to YC with this terrible idea. <laughs> I mean, why is this a terrible, Jared? He was so bad. <laughs> Let me see if I can do it justice. Okay, here is the original idea for Segment that they applied to YC and got in with. The idea was you would be sitting in class, just like this one right now, and all of you would have a laptop in front of you. This is before smartphones were eyes right. You would have a laptop in front of you, and there would be a web page. And on that web page would be a button that says, I'm confused. And as the professor was teaching, if you were confused, you would click the I'm confused button. <laughs> and if enough people clicked it at around the same time, there'd be like a light it would show up here, like, it would like turn red, and the professor would be like, oh, they're confused. <laughs> like, I should try explaining that again. But maybe it's clear to you why that is such a bad idea, because students were on their laptops, not on this site. Not on this site, um, on Facebook mostly. They were Facebook or, or playing games, games yeah. or something <laughs> when laptops were around, allowed, and the, they were not paying attention to the classes was not clear to the founders that this was a bad idea. And this is, an, this is a non-intuitive thing about YC, is we fund a lot of founders that have ideas that we hate. The reason that we do it is because we have learned that what makes a startup is the team and not the idea. And so it's not that we funded Segment because we thought this idea was so great. We knew this idea was terrible and we told the founders that. But we could tell that they were really smart and we figured that they would figure something out at some point. Yeah, I think Calvin has taken, he was a CTO, has taken a distributed uh, class course from the graduate version from Robert Morris, who was one of the founders of YC. Anybody taking a class from Robert Morris? A few of you taking a class from Robert Morris. Robert Morris is one of the four co-founders of Y Combinator, and he's still a professor at MIT. What, what class does he teach now? Operating systems. Okay. Which is a hardcore class, right? Yeah. That was a good class. So Calvin was pretty hardcore. So that's one of the reasons we funded it. And so the story then goes, okay, they actually raised money with that terrible idea. You'd be surprised. YC does wonders to that. Yep. They, <laughs> they raised money. With the YC Halo effect, they were actually able to raise money with this idea. And they grinded out two years. I mean, they were graduating, so they were living um, in the same apartment. Mm -hmm. And because they went at, at MIT, they were roommates. So I think they shared like a triplex or quad. So they, like that. So they used to like be very scrappy. So they were about to run out of money, <laughs> out of two years, like this is not working, they're refusing to give up. Yeah, we, for two years we told them this idea sucked and they should pivot. And they were just like, no, 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 it's gonna work. Um, and then eventually they were gonna run out of money and they did a final office hours with PG when they were basically the bank account like it hit zero. And they were just like. That was December, yeah? Yeah, like, what do we do? <laughs> What do we do? So, uh, and they went on a walk with Paul Graham around like the YC cul-de-sac. We had this little like cul-de-sac where people can walk around. And Paul Graham would always do these like walking office hours. And in that office hours, it came out that in the course of building this idea that nobody wanted, they had also built 
this thing called segment.js, which is this little open source JavaScript library that lets you like federate out your events to multiple analytics programs. It's just a thing that they needed to build this edtech thing. Which is very esoteric. It's not something as a, as a student you get to learn. I think even in the process of building a failed idea, a startup, you become an expert in this super niche stuff that it was very hard to build and it, because you just have to problem solve, you just kind of build it. It turns out a lot more people kind of needed that. So then, I mean, the other thing that was a wake up call was PG just told them very like YC style. So you have nothing to show for after two years and all this money. money yeah. <laughs> and that really shook them. <laughs> and then they decided, okay, whatever, heck, we're just gonna launch this thing, this like file on HN. How many of you read HN, Hacker News? Hacker News is this like news website that YC runs. It's similar to Reddit, but it's all news about like programming and tech stuff. More well, like a nerdy Hacker News. I think it's yeah. good. It's good stuff. Yeah. So they launched it on Hacker News, which there's a lot of engineers that hang out in there. And they got an like, awesome response with a lot of upvotes, which is actually hard to get out of out of uh, Hacker News. If you know the community, it's like a bunch of uh, curmudgeonly like engineers that are like very whatever. Too sure of themselves, let's just say that. <laughs> I'll say it nicely. But I mean, smart people. So when smart people detect that you have good stuff, it's like, oh, there's something there. So then it took off, and that was the idea. And the reason why they launched is because Peter, the CEO, was actually very skeptical. The other three co-founder, co-founders convinced him to just get it out. It went out, and it worked out. So eventually they, and now fast forward to 10 years later, they sold the company for $3 billion to Twilio in 2020. And they were just like you, sitting here and being young and getting it out and getting more shots and gold. Worked for them, right? So I think that's the cool thing of starting a company when you're young. It's like, this stuff is hard and you're gonna fail and you're gonna keep trying it. And time is something that you all have. I think when you're in your we should talk about AI as long as we're doing startup ideas. Oh yeah? What percent of the batch, the summer community <laughs> batch, was doing AI startups? 60% out of the 250 plus companies we funded. In summer 23, we're doing AI startups. And that is the most that there have ever been, like the highest percentage of the YC batch all doing like the same kind of thing ever in history. Um, so this is a very special moment in time to do a startup, particularly if you're in this room, if you're technical, because like this AI thing is like really cool. And the reason why so many AI startups are getting started is because people are like genuinely really excited about what has just been unlocked and all the startup ideas that are now possible that weren't possible just a couple of years ago. So there's just like, with, with this AI stuff, there's just like, great startup ideas just like lying on the floor. You're gonna like trip over them. It was really cool to actually work with a lot of companies in the current batch. They arrived at good ideas so quickly. Yeah. And in fact, I've worked with a team that dropped out of MIT. I don't know, how many of you know Neil and Jessica? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I worked with them. And they applied with a very different idea. I think it was something that was for um, ads, gener generative AI ads or something. It was like, not good. I told them it's not good. But anyways, they dropped out of MIT because they were hardcore. They knew they wanted to do a company and they said to themselves, this is the best time to ever start a company. We don't want to miss the boat on this rise for AI. So they dropped out of MIT this summer and then they built this uh, tool for helping businesses automate business processes. And it's working out well. I mean, they, they close around and everything and they're now running and there were Maybe some of you, if you're considering dropping out. Maybe we should talk about dropping out. I want to do a final point about ideas. Oh, yeah. Which is, I want to debunk one of the most common things we hear from students, which is the belief that in order to start a successful startup, you need to have a great startup idea. And we have some numbers for you to debunk this. So let's talk about your Summer 23 group. Of the companies that you funded and worked with this summer, what percent pivoted after you funded them? So I work with 25 companies closely and 15 pivoted. Neil, 
<laughs> so 15 out of 25 of the companies that you funded pivoted after you funded them. Yeah. And some even like three weeks before that way. <laughs> Real short. I actually won right before them. Okay. <laughs> And like, what happened to these companies? Like, they applied to YC with some idea that they must have thought was good, otherwise they wouldn't have applied with it. But then like, what happened? And how did they find a new idea like in less than two months? Yeah, so I think this is the thing that's uh, going through the batch is kind of this process where you really get pushed to really test it out and grow. And when for example, just take the example with you and Jessica. If you are not closing customers and it's just very lukewarm responses, it's not something that people want. And there's a lot of signs that probably should pivot. And the way we work with companies to pivot is actually we give very custom advice for the company because every situation is different and every founder background is different. And it depends on the idea of phase, where things are. So we work closely with one of us. Like, how many companies have yours been? About half of them. Yeah. yeah. And like the basic move that we do is, it's going to sound almost like Star Wars Yoda stuff. It's like we try to like reach into the founder's brain and find the startup idea that they have but don't realize that they have and pull it out of them. Yeah. It's kind of going into, uh, into the idea maze and zooming yeah. out. Because you have it in you. It's not like we're making up ideas. It's not like we're telling you to. Right. Not at all. Like yeah. That's not it. But these are ideas that founders experience themselves. That's like Paul Graham and my segment story. They were literally the entire two years, they were banging their head against this terrible like edtech idea. They had the idea for segment in them, and they just needed Paul Graham to like pull it up. So. Well, I was just remembering, now you talk about a segment. You work with Scale.ai. You were yeah. the group partner for. Yeah, who knows Scale.ai? Okay. Does anybody know what Scale.ai apply to YC with? Yeah. Yes. It was a it was a website to book appointments with doctors. <laughs> <laughs> and in the course of the ten minute YC interview, we established that Alex and Lucy knew nothing about doctors. <laughs> knew nothing about like why anybody would want this product, but we're really smart. And so we funded them. <laughs> <laughs> that was what went through your brain. Yeah, that was exactly what went through our brain. And sure enough, three weeks later, they decided that this like doctor's appointment idea like had no legs and decided to pivot. And the way they ended up with Scale of AI is basically just like they were talking to friends who worked at other tech companies, and a bunch of their friends had this problem that they were doing machine learning and they needed label training data, and it was like kind of hard to use the existing providers to get label training data for machine. And that happens during the batch. It happens during the batch, yes. And the crazy thing, a lot of you, maybe, I don't know, how many of you know the batch is only three months? And they made this whole thing of pivoting this to thing. getting their first paid customers. customers. Yep. All within just three months. Yep. It's incredible. Yep. But that's actually the norm in YC. Yeah. That's, actually, that's actually like actually what most companies do. All these 15 companies are pivoted. They did that that I worked with. Yep. And for you, half of them all did it. So that is, that is my debunking of the idea that you need a great startup idea in order to be successful as a startup founder. Like clearly that is not the case. Um, that brings us to the next topic, which is here's something that you do need that not all people realize that you do need. And the thing that you do need is you do need a co-founder. And this is not at like at the level of like physics. Like at the level of physics, you do not need a startup, like co-founder to start a, a, a successful startup. Like it is physically possible to start a startup without a co-founder. But if you look at the actual empirical data, 95% of the billion dollar companies that came out of YC like had a co-founder. And so it is empirically much harder to do with that. And we, we looked at the data, as Jared mentioned, and part of it is doing startups is hard. Like you're failing a lot, like a lot, and if you're, especially if you're all very smart here, maybe you're acing, acing your classes and school and everything was easy because you're like very smart, it's a punch in the face to start failing when your customers tell you they're stuck, they don't want it, or you get rejected by investors or whatnot. Yeah. And having a co-founder is so important because it's kind of your emotional anchor. 
and they live with this with you to share this with you. And that, I think, is the biggest thing, just having a strength hold of someone that you really trust. Not just capable. I think the mistake we see with uh, when founders try to get a co-founder, they overfixate in the skills. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. I need a. I need someone who's really strong with back end. Oh, yeah. I need somebody who's really good with ML or data science or something. Yeah. Yeah. I need someone that's an expert in um, data or expert in insurance or expert <coughs> in health or whatever. Yeah. And more often than not, sadly, those teams fall apart. Who should people start companies? So, I'll tell you about my co-founder. We went to school together, we took computer vision classes together, and we were friends before we did that. Because part of it is, doing AR, by, by the way, it's hard to. <laughs> we pivoted, we were selling to the wrong environment, and we got a lot of rejected, but he was uh, someone that we hang out socially, and we were friends to start with. I think, I think the best teams, stay together because even before the startup, you had the foundation of friendship and trust, not just the skills. What about? I started my company with my, my college friend, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about like people having each other's back. My co-founder is still running this company 17 years later. That's how long startups sometimes take. It's, a, it's, like, it's like a big company now, um, and he's still a CEO. And um, a couple months ago, he was going through some real struggles with the company. Um, there's like, it, it hit a real rough patch. He was having a bunch of controversy with the board and with executives, and there's like, like, a, like a, a really big issue. Um, because unfortunately, startups don't ever get easy. Like, they're still hard, even when they're like large and successful companies, like, shit still goes wrong. Um, and like, who did he call? He called me, even though I don't even work there anymore. <laughs> and like, that's, that's what like a co-founder is like. And like sometimes people tell me like, oh, I don't need a co-founder, like, uh, like I'll just hire some employees. And it's like, mm. 17 years later, when you're having a lot of shit hit the fan with your board, you don't call up like your first engineer and ask them. <laughs> <laughs> like the reality is that this role as a founder can get very lonely. You can feel like nobody gets your when the company becomes successful, it feels like 0.001% kind of problem. Like, who even kind of is going to get you? Huh? Yeah. And the more you get there, it's like so tough emotionally. Yeah. And having someone that has this faith and it starts basically like, like a baby yeah. with you, like really gets you and the problems are in the same way. You don't even have to explain. And it's just kind of so, it creates this kind of virtual cycle. And that's kind of what helps. Like, this is such a long journey. And I think another way startups die is the founders just uh, give up because it's just so tough. Like, so earlier, I promised to tell you like the good, the bad, and the ugly of startups. So here's a bit of like the bad and the ugly. Um, like Dan was saying, startups fail like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the biggest differences between being a startup founder and being a student or an employee. And when we fund people who are like, like for almost all the people that we fund are first time founders, and they've never been a founder before. They've been a student and sometimes an employee before. And this is like the toughest lesson for them to learn, particularly people like the folks in this room who have excellent resumes, who have, you know, they got straight A's in high school. They're used to being excellent, to being like the best in the room at everything that they do. Doing a startup is the first time in your life in which the default outcome will be failure. This is like wildly different from school. In school, if you go to classes, if you are very smart, as everybody in this room is, and if you just like do the work, you will do well in school, and you will graduate, and everyone in this room is going to graduate at MIT. And um, similarly, if you go work for a company, like a big tech company or something, and you just like show up at your job, and you do your job, and you're like smart and confident, as everyone in this room does, like you will succeed. Like, like guaranteed, every single person in this room 100% success rate at being an employee, 100% success rate being a student. But the same thing is not true with startup founders. And I guess the other cool thing of why getting a co-founder, if you're doing it with your best friend, like when else could you get to work with your best friend? Like, yeah. 
it, you can't just end up working in the same company in the same team. That the happenstance of that is very low. And the other cool thing with working with your best friend is there's a saying that you become the average of the five closest people to you. And I don't know, do you want to be the average of the five closest people at your big tech company? But imagine like your friend who you respect a lot, you think that the smartest and kindest and you really respect them. That is such a special bond, it just multiplies. Um, a bunch of the people in this room like probably are not yet ready to start a startup. They are interested in doing one in the future, but they don't have an idea yet, they don't have a co-founder right now. Like what should they do over the next couple of years while they're at MIT to set themselves up to do a startup at, in the future? Yeah, so if it wasn't clear yet, one of the key things on why MIT founders are so good is become the best in, at technology, something technical, become the best at it. Because being able to build and ship very quickly is what's gonna really stand above average. The average founder, an average company just dies. So one thing is you can stand above that, and that's 100% in your control. What is not in your control is whether you figure out an idea that really works out. That takes a lot more iteration, but it's 100% in your control to build up the skills to be the best. And what that might mean and what that looks like, it could be you get very interested in certain technology and chase the curiosity. I think, Paul Graham, how many of you um, have read recently the essay from Paul? Paul Graham, How to Do Great Work. Oh, wow, cool. It's so, a very long essay. I'm impressed you stuck with it. But basically that essay, like if you become world class in something technical and you actually have fun, the key thing is not just becoming good, like the best people, the top performers in the world, they genuinely have fun and become good at it because it's like, oh, you just naturally stay up and geek out, I don't know, on LLMs, or geek out on OpenAI, or all these like Llama index, or go through these Discord channels, and like, why are people building this? And become like really great technical. What are other things? Get good at building stuff end to end and launching it. This is a thing that you won't get if you just do internships. If you do internships, you know, at some big company, you're gonna work on like some little piece of some like giant existing code base. And if you do like class projects, you might like build stuff for your class, but you won't build stuff for users. Like the core thing to get good at is like actually building products end to end where you built the whole thing and then you put it out in the world and you get someone to use your thing. And the best way to do this is to do it not with a startup, not with something that you think is gonna be like a billion dollar company. That sounds like really high stakes. Is to just do it with like anything that you find interesting. Build something like for your dorm or for your class or just like something that you think would be cool. Um, most of the YC founders that started like billion dollar companies before they started their startup, they like built a bunch of other random stuff that they launched that wasn't a startup. It was just like something interesting to them. And through doing that, they like built these skills that like caught, that enabled them to actually do their startup. And I think that is something that you all especially can stand yeah. above the noise to do because we hear so many students talking about wanting to do startups. Yeah. It's so wannabe, it's just like they go into just talking about ideas, but never like touch the keyboard. Who here is doing Hack MIT this weekend? Okay, so Hack MIT, that's like the perfect opportunity to like try building and launching like an end-to-end -end product and like getting users for it. And the other cool thing through this, if you're still looking for a co-founder, you could, in a very low-stake environment, is really just build a bunch of projects together. It doesn't have to take a long time. Sometimes people think, oh, you're gonna commit for like a semester or something. Mm -hmm. But do like a hardcore project for like a week. And yeah. Build it. Like hack and my team, you can do quite a lot of things in a weekend. Like if you pair up with someone to test each other, figure out, like build something and ship it out. Like launch it in an app store, build a web app, a Slack bot, whatever it is. Whatever it is, a GitHub project, open source, those are cool. Yep. Um, another thing is, particularly if you don't have a startup idea right now that you want to work on, but if you really want to do a startup, one of the best ways to get a startup idea 
in the long term, not like today, but like in the long term, to put yourself in a position to have a great startup idea, is to go become an expert in an area that is likely to be fruitful with startup ideas. So basically, if you go learn something cutting edge, like you go become an expert on the LLMs or diffusion models or whatever you find intellectually interesting that's like a cutting edge area right now, um, you will find startup ideas there. Um, Paul Graham has this phrase, he says, live at the edge of the future and notice what is missing. I think that's the story of uh, Brian Armstrong, yeah. the founder of uh, Coinbase. Any Coinbase users here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but basically he was a very early crypto aficionado when nobody really heard from Bitcoin. Yeah, like in the very early days. Yeah. And he realized that there was like no easy way to buy Bitcoin. I mean, that, like if you just wanted to buy Bitcoin, it was like really hard to do. You had to install all this stuff. It was like, yeah, it was very hard. Um, should we take some questions? Uh, yeah, so we should take a selfie there. Let's take a selfie and then we're gonna do some questions. Do you want us to stand up? No, actually, sit. yeah. Everybody just stay where you are and then we're gonna do some questions. Could everyone hear, or should we repeat the questions? Okay, so the question is, if you're building a deep tech startup, how do you balance doing R&D with selling? And it turns out we have the perfect person to answer this question, because Diana built a deep tech startup. Yeah, so we, I don't know how many of you come from robotics, we got this algorithm called SLAMP, so simultaneous localization and mapping, working on very low compute. And AR hasn't really worked with a lot of it, because it's a hard computer vision problem. And the reality is we build a lot. And I think the hard part that I wish we would have done that we figure out from YC was more validating that people wanted that. Because it was a bit of a tech hammer looking for a solution, honestly. So the key thing is uh, the risk in both sides. So you have to build enough of, a, enough of it to prove that it works. We got demos. But until we really got it working through all devices and all phones and all environments, it took us really like three, four years to build, to ship eventually to Pokemon Go when we when we had an exit to Niantic. But with that, it was we had to plan a map to show, oh, we got the first multiplayer working across just two phones. We like really constrained it to work in one use case. And then we then had to find actual 
users that wanted this, and it was not marketing. Um, movie Studios, which is what we started when we were at NYC. <laughs> then we found the real people that wanted this was actually gaming studios that were building AR apps. Does that answer your question? Uh, next question. Uh, back there. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, yeah. My name is Khaled. Uh, I'm a senior. I, I don't go to MIT, though. Uh, I'm coming from Rutgers. But my question was, uh, a big thing that kind of discourages me sometimes when I think of like startup ideas, and like the one that I'm thinking of right now, is that sometimes I'll Google it, and I'll, you know, there's other companies that are already doing something kind of similar, or they're even pivoting towards that, and there are new updates and stuff like that, and I immediately kind of just throw it in the trash bin and say, you know, that's not worth my time. How do you kind of, you know, is that even like a good way to go about it? Should I be trying to compete with that? You know, so I'm glad you asked this question. So the question is like, hey, I keep having startup ideas and then I Google them and I realize that they're already competitors. What should I do? Does that mean that it's a bad idea? Should I like find a different idea instead? Because this is actually one of the most common misconceptions about startup ideas. Most of the YC billion dollar companies were not the first company to do their idea. When they launched, there were already companies doing their idea. And so if you're throwing all the ideas in the trash because there's an existing competitor, you are throwing most of the good ideas in the trash. In fact, most of the time when you have a startup idea and there's literally nobody else who's doing it right now, the reason why no one else is doing it is because it's a bad idea. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. So uh, you should all watch this video from Dalton and Michael called Carpet Ideas. Uh, you should all watch this video from Dalton and Michael called Carpet Ideas. Yeah. And they're like, why are there no apps, successful big companies that do travel planning? Yeah. Sometimes the reason that it seems like there are no startups doing that idea is because a thousand of them tried it and they all failed. And they failed so quickly they left no footprint on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> if any of you are doing travel planning, it's a hint to change your idea. Yeah. Um, but to give some famous examples, um, when Dropbox launched, it was something like the 20th file sharing and storage solution on the market. When Google launched, search engines had already been a thing for 10 years. When Facebook launched, social networking was done. Everyone in the US and, and, the, and, and, and the UK was already on some social network that wasn't called Facebook. So like, people don't realize this because like the history gets lost over time and it just seems like Facebook and Google have been around for forever, but that's actually not the way the, the actual history goes. <laughs> Over here. Hi, I'm Gabe, um, junior in aerospace engineering. I was wondering, you brought up a lot of stories of different startups that had different timelines for their journeys. So sometimes six, six years, but also like maybe a year, two years. And I was wondering, when is it a good idea to commit to an idea and double down versus say, this isn't going to work out, even if uh, you think you're meeting a need with your audience? If I were to rephrase the question of basically when should you pivot, right? Well, or is it when should you know that like your idea is working well enough that it's worth going full time and doing your startup? Which of the two questions? Kind of the second one. Okay. Okay. So here's the thing, folks. Many startup ideas do not show outward signs of success for a long time. And we gave this, Kayana gave a whole bunch of examples, Benchling, Benchling. right? Um, and so I'm gonna give you two answers to that question. The first thing is, if you're doing a startup idea, you gotta get comfortable with the idea that you're not, with the uncomfortable truth, that you may not know for sure that it is a good idea for a long time. And so it is possible that you will like waste months of your life working on a dead end idea. This is an uncomfortable truth of doing startups. And the best way to like decide to do that anyway is to work on a startup idea that you personally have experience with, where you're solving a problem that you personally have or someone that you know has. And the reason is if you're doing that, then you can actually be confident even before you have customers or users or revenue or anything that this is actually a good idea because you actually understand the problem. <coughs> where people get kind of, where people kind of screw themselves is they go and decide to work on some idea that they don't really know anything about, but just think intellectually it ought to be a good startup idea. And then when they don't immediately get traction with it, they tend to like get really sad and they pivot or they give up. But like the reason that Sajid stuck with Benchling for so long is because he personally had this problem. He knew it existed because he had it. And then the second answer that I'll give to you is 
I think the decision to go full time and work on a company full time has basically nothing to do with your idea and whether it's working. To the point that we made earlier, 60% of the companies in Diana's group pivoted. That's after they went full time. So they basically they decided to go full time for some idea that didn't work out anyway, but it's okay. And so I actually think that like most students, when I talk to them, they basically want to be like, oh, Jared, like how much traction should I have before I know that my startup is working well enough that I should like go do it full time? And the answer is like there is no answer to that question. The way to decide that you want to go and work full time on a startup is much more of a life choice about like what you want to do with your life. It's basically like the time to go and work full time on your company is when you have a co-founder that you really love working with and the two or three of you are just like having a great time working together on whatever it is you're working on. And when you reach a point in your life, maybe you've graduated or you get super bored of school and you decide to drop out or like whatever, but you've like reached a point in your life where you like want to go do a startup because it just seems like a fun thing to do, not because your idea is hockey sticking. If you're waiting for a, a social, for a, like social network, the movie kind of moment to drop out of school because your like idea like took off on campus, like you'll never do a startup. That is like one in a million. That happens very rarely. Even among things that become billion dollar companies. I think a lot of the successful founders at YC do it for intrinsic reasons. Yes. And it's not because of outcomes. I know a lot of you here are at MIT very competitive and want to win. Of course, there's that. But you don't do it because you expect this 100% success. You have to do it because you want to perhaps work with a friend. Like, it's kind of impossible to do that if you want to work at a job. Or you're very excited about this technology. That, that was in our case for me. I wanted to really work on AR, computer vision, and there's no way you could do that outside. Or it could be that you're very ambitious and want to build something big, and this is your shot at it. And to prove yourself that you can be the best, and not just to get MIT. Got more questions? Yeah. One, maybe one more question or two? Yeah. Let's do two more questions. Let's do two more questions. Over there in the back? So you talked about earlier that like um, you know like you have a good idea, um, but that, that doesn't mean that you have like competition. Um, so I was wondering like if you give us some insight on like how do you know um, that like how do you know like how or like what's the best strategy to like compete with other like um, companies that are already like established in the industry? Like how do you know that you can also take this idea? So is the question on how do you compete with like bigger players that are building the same idea? Yeah. So I, I'll tell you a fun story about my startup. So the day we got into YC, Apple launches AR kit. <laughs> I forgot that was literally the day you got into YC. <laughs> Apple launches a direct competitor to the thing that you've been working on for three years, yeah. and they're going to bundle it with iOS and give it away for free. <laughs> that was uh, day one of YC, roller coaster. So we had this long walk with my co-founder, and we actually were freaking out for sure. We were so scared. We we're very scared, and we were lost. I think for a couple of weeks trying to decide if we wanted to pivot because I think we had an office hour with Jared, and I was like, "Oh, it's still early to figure out another idea." We tried, but then. We thought, okay, if Apple actually launches this, it actually might be the best thing that happened to the company because AR wasn't really a thing. And when you have someone coming in, it's like maybe you could do a lot better than them. Like Apple would definitely not do cross-platform and they would never do uh, multiplayer and collect data. And these were things we were planning to build, but they were very hard to build. And we did that whatever next year, two year roadmap and crunched it in into a month to prove that we became the first cross-platform with backend and mapping in a month. And that was the right bet. That was what gaming studios signed up with us. And so sometimes actually having a big player actually is a good thing. It's actually more, I think Jared mentioned this earlier, if there's no big player, no big company solving this, it's more of a, it's a, it's a fallacy, it's like survivorship bias. Uh, next question. Um, over here. Oh yeah, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm Ani. I'm a junior here studying computer science. I had a question about how the life of a startup at YC generally looks like after the three year, uh, the three month batch, especially like startups that may be in more like deep tech, like long horizon spaces that may be like 
working in fields like climate or robotics that are like very like far in the future, but like like very much things that like a lot of people are very excited about. I'm curious how the life of a startup at YC Germany looks like and whether the YC model is a good fit for companies like this. Okay, um, I can take this one. Um, so the question is like, hey, if I am building a deep tech company, it might take me like years to build this thing. YC is this three month program. Like, is this a good fit? Like, does this make sense? And um, this is like a really common um, misconception. So I'm glad that you're giving me an opportunity to address it. Um, a lot of the companies that YC funds are like this. In fact, a lot of the companies that the two of us are most excited to work with are companies doing crazy deep tech stuff. So some of the like really cool deep tech like stuff that YC is funded, Cruise, which is building autonomous cars, um, Helion, which is building fusion reactors, Aklo, which is building fission reactors. <laughs> <laughs> They're friends. Um, Ginkgo Bioworks. Ginkgo Bioworks, which I'm sure you guys all know because they're here. Um, Rigetti Computing, which is building quantum, quantum computing. Yeah. Relativity Space, which is building 3D printed rockets to take stuff into space. Astronus. Astronus, which is building telecommunication satellites and actually has satellites up in space now. Mm -hmm. Supersonic jet. Boom, building a supersonic jet. <clears throat> so like, Lots of them. a lot of them. There's None more. of these companies ship their product in three months. You can't build a supersonic jet in three months. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, right? um, and like, so what do you do in those three months? Well, it's really the answer to the question that you asked, which is you basically try, you prove that you're making something people want. That when you do this R&D, at the end of this multi-year journey to actually ship a supersonic jet, like people will actually want it. And you show that it's technically feasible. So like to take Boom, for example, they're the guys who are building the, the supersonic jet. Um, they're building this, they were the first supersonic jet since the Concorde, which is this supersonic passenger jet from uh, that, that that isn't operational anymore. And basically, during the YC batch, their main goal was to get deals with airliners to buy the plane when it's available to prove to investors this is actually something that airlines will buy. And their second goal was to work was to basically work with a whole bunch of technical experts to a complete like CAD design of the plane and a complete technical feasibility analysis to prove to investors that they actually had a design that could actually work. And that you can actually do in three months. And so basically when hard tech companies are funded, we work with them in an extremely bespoke way to figure out what they can do in three months that most de-risks this crazy idea that they're going after. So it's like a test there's a tech milestone to hit, like for us, we're building this cross platform with the player backend system, and then a commercial one, getting these contracts signed. It's like, yeah, I, I will work with you when this launches. Like, Astronis build a baby satellite that they launch afterwards, right? Yeah, um, Astronis actually built like a demo satellite in three months, so that's possible. Uh, Relativity Space actually 3D printed a rocket engine in three months, and they walked around the Demo Day Auditorium with this like rocket engine made of like titanium that they had 3D printed, it was really cool. They have a very cool uh, YouTube video uh, from Barry Tatum, who I know I think was from MIT, and I watched their documentary, it's pretty cool if you wanna go and watch it. Um, one last question, so we don't hold you up for food. Over there? Yeah, you? Uh, hi, I'm Wells, I'm a junior uh, in computer science and neuroscience. I'm wondering, in terms of like your tech stack, is it better to prioritize um, products that are like very well established, um, but maybe have like known limitations, or go for like the new hot things that um, might allow you to do more things, but are less tried and true? I love that you asked this question because when founders join the YC Batch, one of the things that we do is we give them a talk on exactly this topic, and the person who gives that talk is Diana. <laughs> I should have a startup uh, school video on this, on uh, tips for technical founders, and I talk about um, what tech should you choose. And I'll give you the summary. You should choose the tech you're most familiar to move quickly, but your startup is not going to die because of the tech solution. Honestly, if you make it big enough, a crappy, terrible language like PHP, you can build a custom compiler called Hip Hop and still build Facebook. It's fine. It's not going to die from bad programming language. We'll just say that. Uh, one thing we will do after this talk, Jared and I will hang out here so you can come up and ask us one, one question. And if it wasn't clear enough, one of the biggest things for you to succeed is to have a co-founder. So we're gonna gather around and kind of gather around here. How many of you are looking for a co-founder? Raise your hand. Maybe gather around here. 
and you should chat and maybe become. Well, should we do it there or should we do it? Oh, and the food? Or the food is, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we should probably appoint a corner for the room with food, right? We should wine and dine our co-founders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can follow Joan. So if you need okay. a co-founder, like, we'll gather around yeah. Joan. We might be too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Before we wrap up, I have one, like, final thought to leave everyone with. Um, the final thought is this. The folks in this room are a very special group of people which is why we flew all the way across the country to talk to um, You are all extremely smart, extremely competent, highly technical. You're getting like the best education in the world. Most of you will not actually end up starting a startup, at least not in like a full-time way. Like you'll probably, you know, like a lot of you will do like some student startup, but like most of you will not actually become a full-time startup founder. And that's okay. Like you'll, you know, you'll end up being employees at some like cool company and the, the world needs a lot of like really highly technical great employees. But here is here is a final thought to leave you with. If the folks, if you, the people in this room, decide to become a startup founder and to start a real company, your odds of success are probably much higher than you think they are. And I will give you some actual numbers to back up this assertion. YC, like MIT, is very hard to get into. MIT is like a 5% acceptance rate, and YC is like a 1% acceptance rate. But if you and a friend from YC, if you and a friend from MIT apply to YC and you get in, the chance that you will start a company that is worth $100 million or more is over 30%. I see some surprise faces. Seems surprisingly high, right? Just getting into YC, the chance that you will start a $100 million company is 30%. The chance you will start a billion dollar company is at least 10%. Isn't that wild? And that is assuming no traction, that's like, that's like nothing. That's just like you and a friend from MIT and an idea, which is what we funded YC, it was like two founders and, and an idea. Just that is actually enough to yield like odds of success that are that high. So um, that is the thought that I'll leave you with. I'm not saying that you all should start a startup. But don't let facts and stories about what the average startup is like dissuade you from starting a startup, because you all are not average, and the startups that come out of MIT are not average. They are much better than average, and your odds of success will be much better than average. If it wasn't clear enough, the startups that come out of YC are not average. Yeah. Even another data for you is about 50% of a batch of you get into YC raises a series A, which is unprecedented. The average seed startup, 90 plus percent die. So, yeah, I'll just leave you with these numbers. Yeah. Do you know how to send it? I don't know.